On today's show, Mary Fine joins us to talk about her business as a headhunter for lawyers. She's been holding the line as an HR specialist in the legal field and has a special bent for the ethical woes plaguing our working world. All that and more on Tuesday noon for October 24, 2006. Welcome to Tuesday Noon. We're back. Another Tuesday, another noon. This is Pete Wright. We're coming to you from rainy, lovely, rainy, rainy Seattle. Rainy, gloomy Seattle. <laughs> Which is yeah, what happened? It, it's, what happened? It's sunshine out. What do you see? No, no, you don't see the sun. No, no, that. that's liquid sunshine. <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't live around here, that's liquid sunshine. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> So, and, and I'll tell you why this is funny. Best because plans because we kept is. talking about how it was sunny, and it has been, and everybody's coming to us during the show saying, we don't want people to move here. There, there's too much traffic here already, so tell them it's rainy and ugly and smoggy, because that way they won't move here. So, today we're, we're coming to you to from dreary, natives. dreary Seattle, Washington. Seattle has yes. been kind enough to host us, our road show, and... Uh, and we could come to your town, too. Uh, we, we do have certain requirements Box for lunches. food and, and accommodations, <laughs> and we will get those to you, but do email us because we would love to travel to where you are. You are listening to the dulcet tones of Mr. Jamie, Jamie Whitley. Whitley. Jamie, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. And across from you is Mary Bradbury Jones. Mary, as always, it is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to Happy see Happy Tuesday you. noon. Happy Tuesday noon to you too, Pete. You guys are uh, sick. <laughs> Get a room. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Well, we have a very special guest today, Detail. and I, I am very excited. We have Miss Mary Fine with us today. Hello. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, you happy to be here? I'm very happy to be here. Your first podcast? It is. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And Mary has a very strong background in human resources, law. I'm very interested to hear about that, employment mm-hmm. law. She works a lot with lawyers, so if you have any lawyer jokes, we'll make sure we get, <laughs> we get those out of the table as, mm-hmm. as well. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about talking about ethics as well, and I'm very interested in that topic. So tell us a little about yourself. Where do you come from? What are you doing here? Well, I love Seattle, and I'm very defensive about our city here, and the fact it is beautiful. It and is a beautiful state, but all don't the move time. here. <laughs> all the time, all 32 days. <laughs> My husband's from Southern California. All he does is gripe about it up here. So I get very defensive, <laughs> very defensive. But I'm, I'm basically a, a homegrown Seattleite. I love it here. I, I teach at the University of Phoenix. I'm a lead faculty member there. Um, I'm also doing a lot of HR consulting and have been doing headhunting for about five years and mainly with lawyers. I place lawyers in corporate and law firm settings across the country. So are you trying to find experienced lawyers or new grads? Or? Uh, mainly experienced lawyers. In what uh, areas? Any law. Law. <laughs> Dude, you know, you're killing me. No, no, no hold on. Hey, law you know, the door is, is open. Let's just make sure that, that you it. understand. They, they have to be admitted to the bar. Yeah. Okay, so me. bar uh, past lawyers. Okay, we've narrowed it down again. Okay, that's enough out of you. <laughs> well, you're cut off. There are different types of lawyers. Okay. There, there are maybe employment law, intellectual property, patents, you, criminal, you, you criminal uh, uh, injury law. Yes. So there are different types of he lawyers. He needs to stop watching law. I think I've learned something law, already. Law harder. Okay. Just because you graduate from law school does not mean you are qualified to be a lawyer for all that stuff. Oh, Thank okay. you. I'll stop practicing. So what kind of lawyers are you looking for? Uh, you know what? I'm... Any good attorneys that are looking for a position or law firms that call me. I have a lot of general practice law firms that have a need in a special area, and I will either handle that myself or team up with another recruiter to do it. Um, I've dealt with a lot of intellectual property lawyers mm-hmm. because I've uh, worked with intellectual property lawyers. In, you, know, you must do a lot of high, high tech intellectual property uh, yeah, just being in patents, Seattle. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, a lot of that. Yeah, yeah it's great. They're, yeah. they're a great group of people. Um, but really, I've done everything from employment lawyers to uh, tax lawyers to just general practice attorneys, divorce attorneys, whatever. So, um, you know, if the need is there, I can generally fill it. Does there seem to be uh, trends? Is there a certain area of IP's, law? IP is still very hot. Bankruptcy is okay. quite hot, unfortunately. That's a, yeah. <laughs> has, I, has, has bankruptcies become... A, a bigger issue now that we've changed the bankruptcy laws to make it more difficult. I is think that... I think so. I think so. But then also coming out of kind of an economic slump, I think we've we've had some issues with with people having to deal with that, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Do you know any good lawyer jokes? 
I, you know, I really, I really don't. They don't tell me the jokes. They don't. No, they're, they're, we'll have to tack some on yeah, or something at the end of the show, the or put them on the website. Just <laughs> Amy will do a special blog. <laughs> right there, you go. <laughs> they will pass them yeah, my way, and then we'll see how far that gets. Special lawyer <laughs> blog. Uh, that's Remember, fun. Nina, the lawyers are her clients. Well, yeah, that's true. right. Yeah, yeah right. we do want to be nice to them because they're probably going to listen to the show. So they probably will. Yes, they're, they're a great them. group of people. Actually, I have worked for lawyer with lawyers for a lot of years, and and yeah, they're they're good folks. They really are. Yeah. So what else do you teach? So you teach Employment law at the university? Uh, undergraduate employment law. Okay. Um, human resource management, a lot of that both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done some organizational behavior and some leadership classes mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Um, I do also speak at um, the community colleges on issues of malpractice insurance. How I got into that, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, I had to deal with uh, malpractice insurance forms and mm-hmm. and uh, renewals and so forth working at at the law firm, it's it's tough. It is this issue of malpractice when we talk about healthcare? Is it a really big issue and driving up costs, like we're told? Uh, I think a lot of people would agree that it is, and a lot of the the lawsuits that are happening are they good lawsuits uh, or are they kind of? Um, I think a lot of the good lawsuits kind of get lost in the shuffle of the the big ones. Okay, you know, you know. $50 million for one individual is a lot of money. Okay. Not that you can put a price on life, but certainly that's driving up the costs. So I think the, the, the argument is that the frivolous lawsuits or the $50 million settlements kind of taint the water for everybody else or the more legitimate lawsuits or what have you. And so that's why they want caps and those sorts of things. But then caps become, well, how can you tell me how much? It, who are you to say... It's it's a really tough situation. Um, there's a really good book out by Catherine Cryer called The Case Against Lawyers, and she talks about the need for reform in that area. And uh, and, and I have to kind of agree with that because things get a little bit out of hand. Um, I know even in the case of legal malpractice, you'll find that when a company is facing perhaps bankruptcy, they, as just kind of a... Uh, thing to do, they they sue their attorneys, who they usually have a huge bill with, for malpractice just to get that off their back. So there's a lot of issues out there that really aren't malpractice that end up in that arena. And anytime you have a situation where you are a potential lawsuit, even if it doesn't come to fruition, you're you know you've got to put it on your your renewal form, and that's going to so potentially th- drive your rates up. I, I got to parse that. Companies sue their own attorneys. <laughs> Using new attorneys for malpractice? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> or do they just have the attorneys sue themselves? But, but it's, it's not their bankruptcy <laughs> is this, attorney. Is this They're why suing. the law is so confusing in this country? <laughs> I'm just well, going to throw it out. Let's say it's the corporate attorney okay. or, or a firm that's been dealing with a corporation on, on their business matters. Okay. Um, and you're the company and you're in financial straits and you, you're potentially going into bankruptcy. Okay. Um, chapter 7, Chapter 11, whatever. First thing you do is sue the corporate attorney. Mm-hmm. Potentially, for malpractice. And and so you can't pay the bill, yeah. and you may owe them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, so you sue so that essentially the bill stops Goes away. at that point, and that gives you more cash or whatever to survive. Or less of a liability against you. Or less of a liability. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's tough. There's, wow, you know, it is. It's that weird. Gives, I've, I've seen that headache. happening. It, that it it gives law firms headaches. And then if you can't collect, you hire another lawyer to sue <laughs> the lawyer who filed the lawsuit for malpractice. I mean, yeah, this is crazy, and you wonder why our costs are going up. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Wild> okay. <stuff. laughs> On that note, <laughs> and you'll wonder why employment law is a complicated class, huh? Well, it is, and uh, I don't want to completely derail us here, but I am so interested to talk about HP. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, oh right. with the uh, the Our uh, friend, board uh, Patricia of Patricia Dunn. Yes, I saw yeah. her on uh, sixty Minutes the other day. Uh, she's resigned happens. now officially. She she's has. gone. Yes. She's effective immediately. Uh, the, what is going on? Well, wh- why don't you, for for our listeners' sake who kind of don't know what you're talking about, just give a real quick right. brief summary. Uh, well, it was it was reported that um, uh, Dunn, okayed by other members of, of by another member of the senior executive staff, uh, allowed the uh, spying on 
board, board members. members and certain members of the media um, in order to, uh, justified by this uh, this theory that there was a leak. Well, there, had, the been there leaks had been a leak. Where things were discussed at the board were finding their way into the, into media, the media just a couple of days later. So. And so they okayed this. She wanted to find the mole. Yeah. Right. So, so she was mole leaker. hunting. <laughs> Who's the leaker? You, okay. you can't blame her for that. You can't blame her for that. No. But at okay, that level. Let's, yeah. just, let's just stop right there. Okay. Is it okay to have that problem and then think, okay, I'm going to hire some investigators to look at our board members? Did she not make some kind of a statement that she was assured that there would be nothing illegal going on during well, this that, investigation? That's or so That's her contention. That's her claim. So when I saw her it in It would be minutes, mine, too. It was. <laughs> I, I hired them. And I told them that they could should find out who it is. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, what are they going to do? Maybe follow them a little bit, different things. These people that they hired went above and beyond and did some things that are mm. that are pretty shady and, and illegal. And and so then it's come back to her to say, you are responsible for these illegal acts and trying mm-hmm. to find out who this person is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now they did find out who it is, uh, but. Uh, they have not fessed up to it. Right, right. And how they did that was, and this is sort of the next level, is they went through and, and used this, uh, they obtained all the personal uh, phone records phone of record. board and, members and, and reporters. They got social security numbers social as well. Security yes. numbers, exactly. Identity, yeah. this yeah. is identity theft. It yeah. is. And, you know, she's ultimately responsible. She hired I mean, You know, I mean, yeah, that's the tough part of being at that level of management is even though you may not know everything that's going on below you, it is your responsibility to know and have mm-hmm. channels of information coming back to you so that you are aware of that. And you have to take the hit for these kinds of things. Now, in the criminal case, I, I, I can't speak to that because I really don't know what's going on. But, I mean, at the corporate level, she was responsible. But, but here's where it gets kind of dicey from just watching her again on 60 Minutes was that once they knew who the leaker was, mm-hmm. they were just going to confront them and say, listen, we know, don't do it anymore, and just call it good. That board member and another board member were not very happy about this, so then they took it to the FBI and the yeah. media and, and essentially created a coup to force her out. Now, to make this even more complicated, it's just like living in Hollywood and Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. <laughs> now Carly has come up and said, Wait a second. Carly Fiorina. Fiorina right. said, I was basically fired with no warning. And the people who on the board who orchestrated this were the same ones that I was really struggling yeah. with. And they were these same couple of guys. So now it's like, what, well, you got some kind of problem with strong women? Or I mean, so now and so were they those, sabotaging They were them. sabotaging the, the, the board was sabotaging them because they didn't like something. And so... And they were the ones who were the leakers in the first place. So did Dunn do something absolutely wrong? I, I guess. I mean, did she authorize it or not authorize it? I don't well, know. And so that's but, the question. Would she? Would any other in any other organization in any other circumstance any other person? Would that be the next logical step to squashing a leak? Is hiring investigators about? Is yeah, that? I, I mean, there. That is we were talking about before the show. Yeah. I mean, that's the vast gray area that. We have to sort of wade into. Is that and ethical? They, is they, that ethical to do that? And did they break laws for leaking information? When you think about, I mean, isn't I mean, HPs? Well, sure. I mean, who did, did, do, what confidentiality agreements did they sign? You know, I mean, we don't know what. Well, right. And so, as employees do, or board you know, members, like what they had. That to, discussion is getting down to this. Oh, well, you know, two wrongs make a right. You know. Well, I'm just wondering <laughs> if they broke the law. When you think about SEC violations or insider yeah. trading or, or that kind of thing, where you're you're leaking information which might be influencing mm-hmm. the stock price. I mean, but it right. sounds like more they were leaking information to sabotage what she was doing. Yes, that's that's, that's the their, speculation. Their, okay. their argument. Okay. So was it ethical for them to leak the information? Absolutely not. I mean, if okay. I if I define oh. ethics in its most rudimentary form of what is ethical, and not ethical is. USA Today rule. If, if your actions would be appear in the front of the USA Today with the article, would you feel comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with everybody in the world knowing you're leaking? Probably not, so it's not ethical. The other question is, would you be comfortable with the whole world knowing that you are investigating and hiring people to pilfer Spy. social security numbers? Mm-hmm. Well, no, that's not cool either. So no. neither one of those no. feel very ethical to me. Correct. Yeah. Of course, where's the focus going to be? What's well, going to be on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But are but companies said, more? Said again, where the focus is going to be on whom? It's going to be on her. On yeah, her. On I her. Mean, she's, uh, yeah. yeah. 
a as, it, as a model, a, a, a tragic non-example of a, you know... She's CEO literally fighting being in jail. Yeah. For, yeah, that's a... Because she's been indicted for responding. Again, she probably didn't respond in the right way to, to other things that other people were doing. Right. And that's... Gosh, that's tough. Interesting. Well, so how, okay, well, you had a specific question, I think. I'm though, sorry. Yeah. With, with all this, we kind of got off on a tangent with the summary. But you no, had a specific I, I, question. Honestly, that was, that was the discussion uh-huh. is, is, you know, at what point, I mean, if you look at a traditional organizational structure, if this had happened at any other level in the organization, right, at mm-hmm. the director, manager, employee level, would the situation have been any different? Yeah, probably. Perhaps. We, I think we need to hold our leaders to a higher standard. And I know some people will argue with that, but I really feel at that level of an organization, you're setting the example. I mean, look what happened with Boeing a few years ago. With, we'll talk about well, that. I, I, you know, I hate to say names, but, you know, Mr. Stonecipher. Mm-hmm. You know, that whole ethical issue. Um, and, of course... Well, we got, that was a couple of years ago. So we yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Data up there so remind us again of exactly what happened, just general. <laughs> um, uh having a relationship with someone within the company and then emails that were involved and brought forward and of course he being the one that was talking about the importance of ethics within Boeing Mm -hmm. because of some of the contract issues they had you know he was very much pushing for that yet on the other hand the feeling was he's doing something unethical he's, he's doing something unethical now at a lower level would someone have taken the penalty that he took for the same thing? Probably not. Or Potentially. Tom, or Tom I mean, Foley, right? Same thing. And oh, again, boy. That, that's, that's sick bastard. But <laughs> <what? No, it's, laughs> We don't mince words no, here. Uh, I mean, Tuesday, you know that. Tuesday noon. I, I, <laughs> call it like it is. Beep that out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it, yeah. On one hand, you have this one, and then the other side, you're acting very unethical. And I don't, yes. Yeah. And, but you, I think you need to hold your high-level executives to a higher standard than, you know, the line manager. Now, you know, when you're talking sexual harassment, you have to be very, you know, serious and, and, and make sure that the discipline fits whatever happened. But, in, you know, in the situation when you're at the top, I mean, I hate to say it, but politically, when you're in top management, you're going to take the hit whether you really had your fingers in it or not. That's where the risk is. It very, is. I mean, That's risk and reward. So you have, you have the higher absolutely. salary and you have, which means you're more accountable, which yes. also means you have more risk. Something goes wrong, you yeah. know, you're more likely to be the yeah. person that takes yeah. the blame for yeah. it. Yeah, but yeah. wait a second. What if what if this Boeing guy, what if that had been a woman and the person who's having a relationship with it had been a man? Would the same thing have happened? Mm-hmm. Probably. Think so? I think so. Yeah. I right. think so. Just because of the, the political climate about ethics at Boeing at that point in time, it was so important. Well, and this is, uh, and course, just looking this up is what makes it, uh, it's put uh, the whole the sort of the whole issue in historical perspective. Uh, Phil Condit was the CEO prior, and he uh, he left in December 2003 for overall the defense procurement Correct. scandals. I mean, this is, Boeing was already in a, in a, Place it backed into an ethical corner of correct. You know, do they do business as a huge corporation? Do they do business? You know, and within the structure of of Boeing, there were tons of things going out about ethics to all the people yeah. in Boeing. I mean, they, it became a focus of Boeing, and I think a lot of this was so that they, you know, publicly appeared that they were really starting to toe the line. And then when this happened with uh, Mr. Stonecipher, I mean, it just kind of blew the whole thing wide right open. Like, hey, you know, he's the guy that's up here, you know. Talking, but he's not walking the talk. It's hypocrisy. Yeah. Do you think exactly. companies are more or less ethical than they have been in the past? I really think that there's a lot more awareness. I think they're they're more ethical. I really do. Or they're at least attempting to be. You know, this kind of stuff's always going to go on. You're never going to get rid of it. I mean, look at sexual harassment as alive and well. When I first talk about sexual harassment in class, people go, "Oh, you know, people are so aware it doesn't happen anymore." But we see it in the news all the time. I see verdicts coming across on sexual harassment cases all the time. So it's still out there, and it's not going to go away. But I think most companies are really trying to, to give the training, you know, put it in the policy, and make sure that people are creating a good environment for their workers. And that's really the whole goal. So if we could, let's, I'm going to go back just real quick to the HP situation. Okay. So, okay, putting to the side the looking up of Social Security numbers, which that's a whole other 
uh, area, but one of obviously spying on them, listening to phone calls, reading their emails. Now, as an employee of a company, right, they can listen to my voicemail anytime they want. They can read my emails anytime they want because I work for them and therefore it belongs to them. It's their equipment. So, since how does that differ, say, for board members? Because they aren't. Uh, they aren't really employees of the company, but yet, I mean, they're being compensated for a role that they play. So, well, is, so was that? So, did they cross over a line because they weren't employees? And that's when they went and listened to their phone calls and their emails. I guess I'm trying to figure out where they differ compared to the average employee at a company. I'm not sure that they would necessarily. I, I mean, I don't know how their structure is there and what kind of. Uh, contracts these people write or whatever, but I, I would almost equate it to a partnership, perhaps, where the attorneys are the partners, therefore the owners of the firm. They're not employees, but certainly in most partnership agreements, there are, you know, strict uh, guidelines, shall we say, about behavior and what could get you removed from the partnership. And, you know, ethics is a big part of that at times, depending apparently, on... Apparently not strict enough. <laughs> what? Well, right. But, you know, I mean... I would suspect there is, there, as part of your board relationship, there is a confidentiality part of your agreement, yeah. maybe a non-compete. So Boeing's not going to go behavior. work for Airbus, Airbus yeah. right away, and those, right. I suspect that would be in there. Does that give you the right to find their social security number and no, not find at all. phone calls? Not at all. I don't think but, so. But all. I'm just wondering, you know, because to a lot of employees, I mean, all the time in the classes, they'll say things about their email, you know, and you look at them and go, you realize that that email does not belong to you, right. and yeah. your employer has the right to look at, you know, and they have right. these looks of just... Shock, you know, they can. Absolutely they can. They own all of that. Yeah. So I get, I'm just wanting to make, for listeners, that distinction. I think there is a difference because I think the board members aren't technically employees of they the organization. Yeah. So that's where the difference is. That's why they really crossed a line listening to their phone To calls. their home right. information, exactly. home phone calls. Exactly. Are companies sifting through employee emails as a general rule looking for things? Sure they are. Yes, Every, yes. t- every time they do server migration, yes. somebody yeah. sits there and actually watches stuff cross over. That's a lot of times how they catch catch um, what a catch oh, people looking at porn sites. Yeah, that's, that's how, how you catch one organization that I worked for. Yeah. Okay, in one swift move, we um, fired about forty people and put fifty people on notice. Mm-hmm. And it all started from a server migration, and the IT guy saw one yep. email come across, stopped it, you know looked, and we started the investigation from that point, and the web went out to 90 people involved. And, and we're talking some very disturbing stuff. Harassment, emails back and oh, forth? Oh, we're talking child pornography, yeah. bestiality. Wow. Oh, my God. Uh, so our- it went everything from, from porn pictures being passed around, and, and the lowest level people were inappropriate jokes, um, foul language. Those were the people that got some warnings, you know, the people fired immediately were the ones that it was hard porn, hard. you know, and, and that kind of thing. So um, are companies actively looking at that stuff, or is it more of kind of an accident type, of, you know what I mean, where something happened and somebody happened to stumble across something? Depends on the structure in IT, I think. It depends how important it is to them. Some people regularly look at it as part of the, what they do. Others that are so busy or too busy or don't care, too large. they don't. Mm, I'm all, I'm gonna. I don't know. That's probably a good question. I would think the larger the company might, the more concern more. they would have. Yeah, yeah, they look more. They probably have the structure set up better to do that. But I mean, they're knowing all. They're knowing your web traffic all the time. Yeah. You know, which is why yeah. at, at well, certain well, companies, most they, of your web traffic is blocked. Exactly. I mean, it's just it's so restricted that exactly. some companies. But yeah, you know, does that help productivity well, or hurt productivity? At one and again, I, I I don't think it. I don't think I firmly believe it won't hurt it as long as you are clear with your employees about what the expectations are, and you're not trying to surprise them. You know, and you're fair and consistent across the board on how you treat folks when this happens. Mm-hmm. As long as they know going in what's happening, I, they may gripe about it. Mm-hmm. But it's like your example. You said people in your class were shocked that you know they could look at this. Well, let people know that we can look at this. Right. I mean, that's... And, and, and so they understand. They may gripe about it, but no big deal. You know, they know. That's fair. They don't know. It's really not fair. Yeah. No. Oh. Agreed, then. How do things like the Enron happen to stay on this ethical... Yeah. How do 
Let me just throw one thing out there. I don't. I certainly do not have the knowledge to know really what happened there. Right. But sometimes I think people at that level think they are above the rules. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really do have a feeling that I'm better than everybody else and I can do this because of who I that, am. That actually kind of goes back to... Um, podcast we had where we were talking about ego and leaders and level yeah, of ego. I was just thinking because that that's the this, dark side of ego. This is the dark side of ego, which is all of a sudden they, they find themselves ab- above everybody else. Yeah, and, the, and then they, in some weird way, I think, start justifying what they're doing to a point that possibly they, be- they, they in a way, talk themselves into what, that what they're doing is not bad. Right. Yeah. And there's a huge payoff. Exactly. I mean, that, I mean that's a big motivator as well. Well, it's in the company's best interest. So when you're looking at Enron, for example, that is maybe hiding some losses and doing some shady things, you might look at it as the person who's running and saying, yes, but look at all the value we're creating in stock for all these different people and helping people and they're getting rich. So it's not a big deal. You you kind of brush it off as being in everybody's best interest. But everybody's best interest is sort of the new evil. You know, it's always in everybody's best interest until somebody goes to jail. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there are different ways to justify your ethics. Doing to others is you would have them doing to you, and greatest good or for rehab. the greatest number. <laughs> or rehab, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, go to rehab and say you were drunk. And <laughs> you were sorry. I've been a drunk for the last 11 years. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, President Clinton had issues with his mother and father. And so, I mean, everybody's got an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's every, a good example. Totally, that's a great example. I, I'm just trying to wind Mary up, but it's a totally <laughs> true example. I mean, in that, and in, in his case, it was you know he's got challenges, and so we all well, have challenges, but well, we all don't go out there and do this weird stuff. Well, that that is true. You know, we so, all have our challenges, yeah. and we could all come up with stories of why we've done whatever we've done. But yeah, well, that's I, a point. Well, I was working with the two of these. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's pretty easy to see. <laughs> well, so that gets back to what we were talking about before: is this this idea of risk in in organizations? Mm-hmm. What what risks are organizations taking by just trying to grow from small to medium sized, and and how do they mitigate these risks as they as they grow and become more profitable? Growth is 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 tough. I I know in in all three of the organizations when I was an employee at the organizations they doubled and tripled in size. Now, we're not talking about huge corporations here. We're talking between one and 200 people in each organization. And even at that level, the, the risks are there because you kind of lose, lose your touch. And the employees are all stressed out because the growth creates such tremendous mm-hmm. stress. And, and trying to keep everybody reined in and calm down, yet you, there's, there's certain things you got to do. There's certain things you got to do, and you got to keep keep your documentation there. You know, I don't know. It's it's, it's a tough situation, but you know, you kind of just got to tap dance on a beer can when you're doing it, because it's <laughs> although not literally on a beer can, <laughs> maybe a Pepsi. <laughs> a Pepsi, right? That's true. But it, you know, it, it's it's taking. You know, was it Al Pacino that said it that it, the game of football is a game of inches? You know, you're just an inch at a time, and sometimes you have to fight to the death for that inch. And sometimes going through these growth spurts, you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's 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 inch by inch, and you're just having to claw your way through it and trying to keep all the fires put out. You know, keeping everything compliant at the same time, and that's exhausting for the employees day in and day out. It's constantly fighting for the inch. It's it's exhausting, but but I think you know that's where HR needs to take the hit, and that's where you kind of need to be. Try to be there for everybody, which is really hard, and keeping that balance. I, I'm there for the employer, and there's a goal for the employer, but I also have to be an advocate for all these employees. But in and the end, aren't you really there for the employer? I get my paycheck from the employer, but I, I honestly think, for me, it was always 50-50. And, and there were situations where I would go to bat for the employee and would not back down, period. Mm-hmm. You know. But in the end, wasn't it? was it... Um, maybe the employee was the initial um, driver, but at the same time, was there maybe an underlying issue of the long-term reputation of the company based on what's happening with this individual, or were they were they truly separate? Does that make sense? I mean, I think a lot of times HR's role is to con- 
is to make sure that the reputation of that organization from a people practices standpoint Correct. Um, stays positive out in the marketplace because we know reputation oh, builds. Absolutely, absolutely. So sometimes you might be fighting for the individual, but really an underlying goal is protecting the overall reputation of the organization in the long term. That's that's that prob- that's very true. I think if it were going to impede on the reputation of the company, I'm going to go for the company yeah, yeah. because then more than likely something's going not quite right over here with the employee. I mean, again, each situation is its own situation. You have to assess it. You know, if that employee is doing something that isn't correct or they're causing problems for the employer, then I'm going to be on the employer's side. But if the employer is doing something that doesn't make any sense, the employee has done nothing wrong, and it's not going to really affect the business, I'm going to, I'm going to go for the employee in that case. Does that make right. sense? Absolutely. You know, why, I mean, absolutely. Why does HR have such a bad reputation among mm. employees? You think HR has a bad reputation? Try being a, a headhunter. Boy, I tell you what, <laughs> they have the <laughs> worst reputation. Well. No, I, you know why? I think because there's a lot of not very good HR managers out there. I really do. Um, I, I tell my class all the time, and I think this is, re- this is one of the hardest parts of being an HR manager. It's a lonely position. You can't be buddies with the manufacturing manager. You can't be best friends with the owner. You can't be out every Friday night with a, a certain group of people because then the trust is gone. They don't, they don't feel you're impartial anymore. You really need to, to, to have the image that you are there kind of for both the company and the employee, but your own person. I'm not on the side of manufacturing all the time. I'm not on the side of sales all the time. And, and I think that's where a lot of people fall down. I've seen a, a lot of people that they just don't trust their HR manager. No, they right. don't. And the, the other, I think, main thing is that very often HR does not make their determinations and their actions based on fair and consistent criteria. They don't use measurables. You know, I mean, if we're talking about performance, there's a lot of measurables in that, not personalities. And, and so I think, you know, it's just... It's not that hard, but I see so many people that can't seem to figure it out. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of I think at the core of, of HR is a for some people it's a common sense. It's common sense, and so then when you're at a trying to help a leader understand that, you know, and they don't they're not coming from the same no, uh, wavelength at no, all. Yeah, and that's that's a tough sell. So then you got to talk to them about the business end of it. Well, right. okay, that's fine. I understand how you feel. You've got these feelings about this situation. However, if you do this, this is going to be the outcome. Right. It may make you feel good today, but in the long run, you're going to lose these employees over here, or you're going to lose money over here. So you kind of have to bring it back to the business you end do. of it, which they always understand because it's their pocketbook. Which speaks to where we were talking earlier in another show at one point where Really, for a, a person to be successful in HR, they've got to have some business background um, so that they can uh, approach those folks in, and, in the right way to speak to them so that they can have the, the partnership versus it feeling like always butting heads. They, they have to have a business knowledge throughout the company. Maybe not able to go down and build whatever the company is building, but they need to be able to understand all the inner workings. And also, they, they kind of need to manage by walking around if they're on site. You need to get out there and talk to people. You, you learn more in the lunchroom, I think, than you do through any survey. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and, and if people feel free to talk to you and pass comments to you, you're going to learn a lot. So that's an interesting, um, kind of going back to what you know, Jamie was saying of why people don't trust HR. So you, you've always had kind of the notion, or you've been told, right, that you have a concern with your manager or something that your organization's doing, that you can go to HR and it's going to be confidential. So people do that. <laughs> Forty-five minutes later, their manager is calling them in, going, "Why did you go to HR?" And, yeah, and you know, exactly. because HR has actually called up that manager and said, "We've got a problem." And and, yeah. and you know, they're fl- they're flabbergasted because they thought they were supposed to be confidential. Horrible. So, you never trusted again. No. But why didn't HR know that that manager was going to do that? I mean, you got to know your people. Well, they never should have gone to the manager in the first place. But and, maybe and maybe it's a situation they did well, need to discuss to, with right. them. But if that right. manager is one that's going to run back to the employee, right. I question whether or not that manager is in the right position. True. And if the if the that's HR so. person has to go, I mean, if it's one of those things of 
you know, we have to approach this individual now, and there's no way to approach them without revealing in some way who you are, then they need to let, I mean, the employee needs to know that. And then yes. I think the HR person needs yes. to say, so are you comfortable because this is the only way this can be handled so that at least that, that employee is ready for it. But take it a step further. I think that's perfect. Then go to the manager and let him or her know, okay, this is something I don't want you going back to Susie about. You know, this is, this was, she's very concerned about this situation. Let's talk about how we can solve it. And, oh, by the way, if you do go talk to Susie, we're going to have an issue here. So they need to know that there's going to be some repercussions for their behavior. They're bad management well, This is behavior. where it gets hard, though, because a good manager who you would go to at that would say, yeah, I mean, I understand. And, and maybe they didn't even, but a good manager maybe might not even done those things in the first place. The ones you worry about are the ones who aren't very good managers, so you'll go to them as the HR person and say, don't take this back to Susie. Right. And they say, oh, yeah, 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 I won't do it. But then subtly behind the scenes, essentially they start making Susie's life miserable. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it, Susie pays a price for that. And this is the negative side. I, I mean, I don't like to think of it that way. But now Susie's paid a price for, for saying things. So, sure, that issue may have been solved. But now that manager's going to make her life miserable and she's going to leave anyways. And it's like, gosh, how sucky is that? It, it's horrible. It's horrible. But but does Susie feel confident to come back to you as the HR manager to say, you know, this isn't working out? Yeah, I don't know. You know, and, and that's that's and where you to, need to get that. But it's hard to prove those little mm-hmm. things when your manager's oh, it's being very hard to prove. But I, I petty I, and or is it, or the other scenario is that particular manager is a dynamo in the company. They are the shining oh, star. So they they don't... bring in a ton of money for the company. I mean, you know. So then all of a sudden now, depending on where you sit in the H in the hierarchy ladder with that organization as the yeah. HR person, you maybe have you know your boss. One time when I was in HR, okay, our boss was the CFO. I mean, talk about <laughs> the hardest person to be. You know, the financial guy who was constantly you know with a thumb on us with our budget and everything. So. So now you go to your boss to say, we got a problem with so-and-so over here, and they're going to look at you and go, put it under the table because he's our shining star. He brings in all the money. Do what you got to do with Susie. Get her out of here. I mean, isn't that probably reality? It, in a lot of organizations, it is. It really is. Unfortunately, yes. You know what? I, I, I think at that point, you as an HR manager need to determine if you want to work in that type exactly. of environment. I and exactly. I know that sounds harsh, but you know you that's get reality. to that level. At least in the partnership I worked with, I had several partners to go to. And if I was having an issue at one level, I didn't let it die. I, I kept at it until enough people were involved and I created enough noise that something was going to happen. And sometimes you have to, you know, HR is a, a lot of PR and a lot of sales. you got to be able That's to go point. sell yeah. your case to the powers that be. And if you can't do that, be it for issues that happen, uh, termination, you know, promotion, benefits, if you can't do that, it's going to be a tough road. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to ask yourself that question. Is this a sword I'm willing to die on as an HR person? And if you are, then... Mm-hmm. Well, I think if, you, if yeah. you're if you the HR person that you really care and are doing it for the right reasons, then you I mean, you do go to bat. I think probably yeah. where you're talking about HR having a bad rep, maybe some of them just aren't going to do that because they're just, well, this is what the company wants and I'm going to wash my hands of it. And you just kind of toe that company line without asking questions or not pushing anything. So you just become a patsy of the organization. Right. It's like, I guess if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But A lot of people do. Yeah, I mean, they're comfortable me. with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't want to make waves. Yeah. This has been very interesting. This is, We've well, talked about a lot. Have, and I you can't know, this believe last, it's already this, over. I know. It went very fast. <laughs> and this last little bit, it feels like there's a real storyline developing. There's like villagers <laughs> and subtext. And this, so true. And so at, true. But what if Susie has this other problem? <laughs> <laughs> What happens yeah. when Susie, Susie's, uh, Susie has to go to the bank yes. and she op- and they foreclose on her farm? Yeah. Oh. Susie's <laughs> pregnant and her boss I says feel. that she needs to I, buck it up. We, that's and, right. And she can't we're take not any family time friendly. Yeah. 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 We're not Susie. family friendly. <laughs> hey, it happens. I it does right. happen. And, it still and happens. And it happens. Yeah, it still happens. Yeah, it, happens. Yeah, it, is. it is tragic. Yeah. Mary, so I, uh, I'm headhunting or I'm a lawyer and I need a headhunter. Neither of which are true at all. Uh, how do I get a hold of you? You have a website? Yeah, yeah. Uh, SeattleHRServices.com. Okay. 
We will put that up uh, on our website. And great, and there's uh, contact information there. Also, I do a lot of help for small to mid-sized companies uh, from the HR HR standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And we can point you point them to your website and stuff. Always like a challenge. That's very cool. Good. This has been fantastic. It's been thank you. It's been wonderful. All right. Thank Thank you you so much much. for sitting down with us. We hope this won't be the last time we run into you. Excellent. And uh, and uh, so Mary, uh, yes, I think we're done. I think another week. Uh, (laughs) This has been Tuesday noon. We will see you next week. We're out. This has been Tuesday Noon for October 24th, 2006. For more information on the show and to subscribe, catch up with us on our website at www.tuesday12.com and write us at the show at tuesday12.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week, Tuesday Noon.